Professor John Coffey uh, on the topic on social engineering attacks and unintended data disclosures, two major categories of end user cybersecurity error. Uh, Professor Coffey holds a BS in psychology from the College of William and Mary, a BS in social science, and MS in computer science, software engineering, and an ED, an education doctorate with an emphasis on computer science from the University of West Florida. Uh, he was one of the first members of the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, and he has worked with that organization for many years. He has been in the Department of Computer Science at the University of West Florida since 1992, starting as a lecturer and working his way up to the current rank of professor. He has published a total of more than 100 referee journal articles, book chapters, technical reports, and conference proceedings. His research interests include knowledge, elicitation and representation, web services and service-oriented architecture, advanced technology for education, and computer science education. Uh, welcome, Professor Coffey. Well, if I'd known uh, the way that uh, Grandin's and Suzanne's talks were going to go, perhaps I would have been a little bit more toward the pedagogical side of things. But as it is in the immortal words of Monty Python, and now for something completely different. Uh, so yes, uh, social engineering attacks and unintended data disclosures are the uh, interesting concerns that I have today. And if I could get this to advance. Uh, so the overview of my talk would be I'll give an introduction to what I would like to talk about. I'd like to talk briefly about insider versus outsider threats to organizations uh, and then differentiate between uh, the haphazard activities of people who make mistakes versus malicious insiders. I'd like to talk a bit about unintended data disclosures, social engineering attacks, and the way that these two actually interact in a synergistic, uh, bad way, and then some implications for interdisciplinary studies to mediate these problems. So if you look at cybersecurity research within my institution, and we actually at the University of West Florida have a Center for Academic Excellence for Cybersecurity Education, the emphasis really tends to be on technological solutions to cybersecurity problems and there is a real paucity of uh, discourse regarding the human aspects of cybersecurity problems, which are, of course, pervasive. We know that threats originate both inside and outside of organizations, and that errors by both end users of systems and system administrators create a great many opportunities for attackers. There has been a tremendous ramp up in programs to educate end users. And according to IBM statistics, as a percentage of total attacks, uh, end user errors are diminishing uh, in terms of percentages, but in terms of absolute numbers, they still continue to increase. And there are fundamentally these two categories I wish to discuss regarding end user error, unintended data disclosures, not specifically precipitated by social engineering attacks, and then those that really do stem uh, from social engineering efforts by malicious actors. With regard to unintended data disclosures, there is of course a tremendous amount of sensitive information that continues to be uh, exposed in these attacks. Organizations truly have all of the guidelines in the world that they might ever need for how to stand up programs pertaining to uh, end user training, but training programs tend to lack practical, actionable details within the programs. I'm actually a certified knowledge worker, I would like you to know, 
that means that I uh, completed about two hours of training in the University of West Florida. It was a canned cybersecurity program and very, very good, highly comprehensive, but with no indication whatsoever of where the particular threats lie, what I'm most likely to do wrong, for instance. So there, there's just this, this very broad discussion of what can go wrong, but not really, this is what you particularly have to look for. And so part of my research today that I'd like to present is in service of trying to figure out what do people actually do wrong that causes, that causes negative consequences. The work that I did is based primarily on a collection of uh, data in the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse. Uh, they've created a, probably the most comprehensive database in the United States pertaining to uh, unintended data disclosures and the causes of those. Uh, so I'll be giving some information about uh, summarizations of what is in the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse database. With regard to social engineering attacks, uh, certainly the uh, current social engineering attacks are much more sophisticated than they used to be. I'm sure many in this re room remember the days of uh, emails in which somebody had $10 million to try to get out of an African nation and if you would only help them do that, uh, you would share in a percentage of the spoils. Uh, certainly, social engineering attacks bear very little bearing on the way that those looked uh, in modern times. Um, there's a fair bit of literature on the most susceptible users uh, who are uh, most likely to fall prey to social engineering attacks. And in fact, younger folks with less experience on the web, even though kids have been brought up on electronic devices, young folks tend disproportionately to uh, fall prey to a, a attackers uh, attacking with social engineering uh, approaches. And people who tend to be impulsive, who tend to just sort of jump website to website, uh, not surprisingly people who spend a lot of time surfing on the web uh, are more susceptible on average to social engineering attacks, even across levels of sophistication with understanding regarding the threats. So then, uh, it's also interesting to note that sources of information that are used in social engineering attacks are pretty well known. And in fact, the first connection to unintended data disclosures lies right here because when sensitive data is breached, that data becomes a factor in social engineering attacks. And interestingly, the more extensive a person profiles him or herself in social media, the more that person presents actionable information that can be used in social engineering attacks. I'd like to say a few words about insider versus outsider threats before we get back to the main themes of the talk, though. Um, it's been pretty well demonstrated that multi-layered cybersecurity technological approaches help to prevent outsider attacks. So for instance, if we have multiple layers of defenses in computer programming, this is called defense in depth. The notion is that if one level of defense doesn't uh, uh, catch and uh, deflect a um, problem, then there will be a subsequent layer and a subsequent layer beyond that. This works quite well for technological problems. It's clear that outsiders are very, very likely to act in malicious ways on information that they can attain. Uh, but it's also the case that insiders are right there where all the data is and don't have to get past any sort of barricades in order to get to it. And despite all of the training that has been put in place, it's still demonstrable that in, in corporate environments, there are a large percentage of employees who really just don't understand the nature, the nature of the attack surface that the organization presents. And the insider breach category interestingly doesn't capture those attacks that originate outside the organization, 
but that had some additional capability to get in because of either uh, negligence, neglect, or an erroneous activity on the part of an insider. Those tend to be, if it was an attack from the outside, those attacks tend to be attributed to outsiders rather than to insiders. And I'm not going to go to this link, but this interesting dis discussion is a website that contains uh, a discussion among 47 experts in the field regarding the relative problems that outsiders versus insiders present. And it turns out of the 47 experts, three stated that outsider attacks are of more significance. Three stated that, well, both of them really are sort of co-equal. One stated, well, it depends on the circumstance, sort of hedged his bets by saying, well, um, you know, in some cases it's outsiders, in other cases it's insiders, but 40 of the 47 said that insider uh, vulnerabilities are more significant, 40 out of 47. The Privacy Rights Clearinghouse is really a terrific organization, folks. Founded at the University of San, San Diego School of Law, uh, and their idea, their whole reason for being was to document uh, it instances in which cybersecurity or privacy rights of individuals were compromised, and then to try to influence public policy to uh, foster greater privacy rights and uh, things of this nature. Interestingly, the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse was the first organization that identified the concept of identity theft, and they got that idea into the public discourse. They've been concerned uh, extensively with data breach notice law, and of course, the idea there is, shouldn't we be doing some reporting regarding when things go wrong? And very obviously we should, but I will have a, quite a bit more to say about that just in a moment. They also were fundamental in passing security freeze laws, which pertain, for instance, to your ability to block access to personal information. Um, I don't know how many of you did in the wake of the Equifax disaster, but you, some of you may know, of course, that Equifax is one of the major credit bureaus in the United States. Uh, about a year ago, they allowed a data breach that exposed sensitive information on 143 million Americans. The main ameliorating activity that Americans could do to try to prevent damage from this was to notify their credit bureaus and say, I would not like, I want to freeze on my credit reports. That was essentially PRC in action because they initiated legislation that ultimately got us to the point of being able to do that as consumers. I'd point out that PRC has one of the most comprehensive databases uh, pertaining to data breaches, but to tell you the truth, it is a mess. Why? Well, uh, the reporting requirements for data breaches are completely non-standard. They are at the state level in the United States rather than nationally mandated. They're highly variable. So here are a few uh, instances of things that I found in the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse database. In many cases, the number of records was estimated uh, very, very frequently unknown. They didn't even know how much data had been compromised. There are 984 cases from 2005 till 2017 that pertain to unintended data disclosures. Of those, 279 cases, or 28%, involved an unknown number of records. A significant number of cases involving medical records didn't have details about how the compromise occurred. We will see statistics, I believe it's 103 of the 989, uh, 984 cases said, we don't know how the breach happened. 89 of those were in the medical, in the healthcare industry. 
In some cases, the total number of records breached was reported, but there were no details regarding how much sensitive information was in the data because, again, the organization didn't know. There was a narrative accompanying every report. Uh, so there were some 6,000 cases altogether in the database when I analyzed it, 900 pertaining to unintended data disclosures. There were uh, narratives with every single one, and narratives would include things that failed to instill uh, confidence, such as between 5,600 or 23,000 patients were affected. Well, so we'll sort of, uh, how is it, um, get a random number generator from computer science, and that's about as good as the guess we could make. In some cases, the total was given as estimated that more than half exposed sensitive information. Uh, some narratives were vague uh, regarding whether it was actually physical or electronic data. It turns out the National Council of State Legislatures uh, is a website you can access and it will give you a state-by-state -state rundown on reporting requirements for this, these sort of data. Um, the laws typically have a taxonomy of organizations, so they say these are the organization groups as our state sees it. Specific definitions regarding what constitutes personal information and therefore reportable, right? the type of event that meets a criterion, that means that it has to be uh, reported. Exemptions, which are highly variable. And I would definitely say typical reporting policy was just couched in legalese. You could, as you read these, you say, yep, the lawyers had a lot of billable hours on formulating these policies, but they vary greatly from state to state. And, uh, an average citizen would really have a difficult time knowing whether he or she was in compliance. With regard to the Privacy Rights Clearing House database, they have a taxonomy of organizations that included financial and insurance businesses, retail business, and then uh, a catch-all category for all other sorts of business, educational institutions, governmental organizations, including the military, uh, healthcare, of course, in its own category, and then NGOs or non-governmental organizations. The categories for breach types included uh, credit card. Uh, the payment card industry, in case you don't know, is really very, very interested in all of this. You know, because pretty much every time you uh, use your credit card for anything, your information is out on the internet, obviously. Um, so they have payment card uh, fraud as a way that data gets breached, uh, hack, uh, hack attacks, external uh, malicious actors trying to hack in, uh, malicious insiders, physical uh, data that is lost, a uh, computer is somehow left somewhere and so they can uh, get information from that, uh, loss of portable devices, uh, unintended disclosures, which is what I'm going to give some statistics about in a moment, and then unknown, they don't really have a category for the uh, breach. <coughs> With regard to the breakdown of quantities reported in the database, so you can see that the three business, the financial services, uh, other and retail are the top three rows in this. And you can see if you average them together, over 50% of the time they didn't know how much data they had had revealed. Over 50% of the time. You can see education, government, uh, healthcare, and NGOs did quite a bit better. They're down somewhere in the 20s regarding the percentage of the quantity of data that, that was unknown. With regard to the cause of breaches, websites uh, putting data on websites or on file sharing of some form or another was far and away the most common cause of data breaches. Email errors were very, very important. Regular mail errors were really important. And it was fascinating reading folks to see what happened in these different categories. As far as websites, there would be things like it was a 
private website where they put sensitive information and then later a system administrator made the website public. It was that uh, it was a public website onto which they put public information that correctly belonged there. But along with the public information, they put sensitive private information that totally did not belong there. So errors of these nature uh, seemed to predominate in terms of website and file sharing errors. Email errors were things like they would address legitimate email to a legitimate person and have it go to a bunch of other folks as well. They would have emails legitimately going to a legitimate person with other people's information inside the email and errors of this sort. With regard to regular mail, it was incredible. They'd print mailing labels with a person's social security number printed on the mailing label. Uh, very, very strange and horrifying things and easily directly attackable if, well, attackable by the attackers, but also addressable if our training materials were much more targeted to these things that people very actually do wrong rather than a broad overview of the general threat landscape. Unknown causes, I said, very notable because of the fact that uh, 89 of those 103 cases, 89 out of 270, almost a third of the ones in the healthcare industry had unknown causes. Uh, Carnegie Mellon University has originated a, an ontology. For those of you, ontology, uh, computer science has borrowed the notion of ontology from uh, philosophy, where it means on the nature of being. Ontologies essentially in computer science means this is a formal classification system, so we have a standard vocabulary, and we can represent knowledge in this standardized vocabulary in order to foster uh, machine reasoning over the, over the knowledge. CMU uh, at the Software Engineering Institute recognized the problems with malicious insiders and created this formal knowledge representation in order to be able to represent knowledge about insider attacks. Uh, this is one, those of you who know what concept maps are, this is much like a concept map. So we'll start uh, over here with a victim organization on the middle left has an employee who is an insider, who is a person. The, um, there was an asset modification action that had an actor who was an insider. These triples are a very efficient way of representing knowledge over which machine reasoners can reason. But there was nothing in the CMU ontology that pertained to end user error. So I actually have a paper that will be coming out in the spring pertaining to extensions to, in order to be able to model end user error. There's a fundamental important idea in order to have consistency in the way that we would represent these cases and therefore uh, better reporting. So for instance, we could have a, the original ontology had only an actor and then an organization as an actor or so a person or an organization were the two types of actors. I extended the, I clarified on person to have a malicious or non-malicious actor that could be either a system administrator or an end user in order to be able to have a higher resolution description of the actors in an event. With regard to actions, I introduced the notion of an error action and the various categories of error actions were basically those that fell out as the major categories from the analysis of the PRC database. Then I could use my extensions in order to model a, uh, an occurrence involving end user error. So we could see here, this was one where a dumpster was found full of medical data records and the Salt Lake City Police ultimately took, took charge of them. So uh, I'll leave it at that for this. There are significant trends in uh, data breach, uh, data breaches and their impacts, uh, particularly affecting government agencies, universities, and healthcare systems. I would point out very interesting, the value of medical records is estimated to be up to 10 times that of a credit or debit card. 
With regard to social engineering attacks, there are a great many different types. I'm specifically interested in a category called spear phishing, which is highly targeted uh, attack based on personal information pertaining to the target in which the attacker tries to uh, attain confidence in the target that the attacker is legitimate. And so using personal information, uh, the, the attacker can make the target think it is a person he or she knows or an organization with legitimate reasons to contact them. With regard to spear phishing, spear phishing is uh, an exploit uh, where we try to use specific knowledge about an individual to gain their trust. So this is a far cry again from trying to get the $10 million in from an African country. Spam with malicious attachments has increased greatly in recent years. In fact, this is my spam folder. This is three weeks out of my spam folder. Uh, all of the attachments for three weeks in my spam folder. <laughs> I get a lot of invitations for conferences. So you will see that in fact, um, this is a conference probably legitimate. This is a conference, so is this, so is that, so is this and that. But you will notice that Cynthia wants to send me an invoice. So does Sherry. Dan Collins really understands how much I buy plants. And so said, well, the spring seeds are available. You will notice, by the way, Barbara Cranston is a person at UWF, and this is an invoice that she would like me to pay. And you will notice that Roosevelt.Silver at UWF.edu sure looks like somebody I should trust. I'm probably not gonna fall prey to these because I understand this, but I fear for the folks inside my community who confront this every day with less sophisticated knowledge. Cousin domains are very, very interesting. Uh, cousin domain is a registered domain that has a deceptively similar name to a legitimate domain. And uh, homograph attacks, I don't have time for that, but that's really pretty interesting. It's just substituting individual letters to make a name look just virtually identical. Substituting a zero in place of an O Right, so you have an uppercase O, you put a zero in, and the, and the name looks identical to one that you, that you might trust. CampusClarity.com, the, the one I would leave it to you, I would have had a pop quiz at this point if we had more time. Uh, the top one is legitimate. The last two looking strikingly similar are illegitimate uh, URLs. This is really what I wanted to get to, should have gotten here more quickly, my apologies. Uh, we have unintended data disclosures and spear phishing attacks. Unintended data disclosures provide inputs that can produce weaponized, weaponizable personal information. That weaponized personal information can be used in spear phishing attacks, which enable us to get more unintended data disclosures. So there is a vicious cycle between these two fundamental uh, problems. If we could ameliorate problem with unintended data disclosures. I don't in the least mean for that X to indicate that we're going to make them go away. We certainly are not going to do that anytime soon. But if we were to ameliorate unintended data disclosures, it could diminish the amount of weaponized personal information and that might have some beneficial effect, effect on spear phishing. Also, if we could start with diminishing the e efficacy of spear phishing attacks, we would have less unintended data disclosure and that would lead to less weaponized uh, personal information. I also wanted to propose that there is significant interdisciplinary work to be done with regard to these issues, uh, particularly the interplay of technical professionals with educators in order to address both of these issues would be extremely helpful. So in conclusion, end user error is certainly still responsible for a significant amount of uh, security issues and problems. It is certainly possible to profile the most commonly occurring types of data disclosures, although this has to be done within the limits of uh, 
that are imposed because reporting requirements are so varying and in some cases non-existent. Um, phishing attacks have certainly evolved into highly sophisticated endeavors and there is a vicious cycle of unintended data disclosure providing information that can be used in highly targeted phishing attacks. And human and technological interventions certainly will help to immediate, are both required in order to ameliorate these problems. And that would be all I have today.